Good morning, one and all. I welcome you all to Ganesh IAS Academy. In today's session, we'll be seeing environment-based current affairs from the date November 17 to November 23, 2023. Let us get into the news articles one by one. The first news that we are going to discuss for today is Global Tiger Recovery Program 2.0. Okay, so what is this Global Tiger Recovery Program? Who has initiated this program? And what other organizations are related to this program? All these details we'll be handling in this topic. Okay, so let us get into the details. Under this Global Tiger Recovery Program 2.0, countries have submitted tiger population numbers from 2010 to 2022, from these 12 years. I mean, in these 12 years, the population numbers have been submitted by the countries to whom? To the Tiger Recovery Program, okay, Global Tiger Recovery Program, along with sites, okay, that is United Nations Conventions on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, that is sites, okay. Next is this 2.0 program aims to pave the way for tiger conservation from 2023 to 2034. This is very important. This may be asked as a prelims question okay from which year to which year it is from 2023 to 2034 okay what are the details do we have to understand from this topic and how has this program evolved that we need to know so st petersburg declaration on tiger conservation this was the initial program from which this tiger recovery program global tiger recovery program has emerged okay so this resolution that is St. Petersburg Declaration. That resolution was adopted in 2010. Okay. By whom? By the leaders of 13 Tiger Range countries, TRCs. Okay. Who assembled at the International Tiger, sorry, International Tiger Program Forum in St. Petersburg, Russia. Okay. And then what are all the 13 Tiger Range countries here? One is Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, China, India, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Nepal, Russia, Thailand and Vietnam. These are the 13 countries which are called as tiger range countries in which maximum population of tiger is located. Okay. And then the resolutions implementation mechanism. We have this resolution that is that St. Petersburg declaration is that resolution. That resolution's implementation mechanism is called as the Global Tiger Recovery Program. Very important to be noted. Okay. And the goal of this program was to double the number of the wild tigers from about 3,200 to 7,000 by the year 2022. This target was set in 2010. Okay. What was the target? To double the number of wild tigers from 3,200 from, I mean, to about 7,000 by the year 2022. This is what we need to know. So we know that this Global Tiger Recovery Program was actually an outcome of this declaration called St. Petersburg Declaration, which was adopted at the International Tiger Forum, which held in Russia. Okay. So what else do we have to understand? We must have to get into the details of what this Global Tiger Recovery Program is and what is the 2.2, that is the upgraded version is, okay? Those details we need to know. So, Global Tiger Recovery Program, this was launched by World Bank in 2010, okay? So, we saw that it is an outcome of St. Petersburg Declaration, but it was launched by World Bank in 2010 under Global Tiger Initiative. So, at another forum that or at another organization that we are seeing that is global tiger initiative we will be seeing about the details of this and then there is another body that is global tiger forum which is an intergovernmental platform which became the implementing arm of for this tiger agenda so we will be looking into the details of what this gtf also okay so gti and gtf those details we will understand and then this 2.0 program was released at Thimphu, where in Bhutan, okay, on 29th July, that is the International Tiger Day 2023. On that day, this program was released, that is 2.0 program was released by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bhutan, the Royal Government of Bhutan, okay. And then this 2.0 program 
emphasizes on strengthening tiger governance, enhancing resources and protection while also addressing the contemporary challenges. Okay, so what is the present challenge that we have? The problem that we are facing now is human wildlife, sorry, wildlife conflict. Okay, so human wildlife conflict is one major problem that we are facing these days. Here the wildlife would be tiger. Okay, so that is what we need to know from this. Next is we saw that it is an outcome of this initiative called Global Tiger Initiative. What is it and what is its aim? Let us understand that. So Global Tiger Initiative was launched in 2008 by World Bank, Global Environment Facility, Smithsonian Institution, Save the Tiger Fund and the International Tiger Coalition. All these organizations together have launched this Global Tiger Initiative in the year 2008. Okay. And then this GTI is led by 13 tiger range countries that we already know. Okay. And then it is the global alliance of governments. So it includes governments, it includes international organization, civil society, conservation and scientific community and also private sector. All of these organization, uh, organizations together who are committed to work together towards a common agenda. What is the common agenda here? It is to save the wild tigers from extinct extinction okay so this is what the goal of this GTI is okay next is GTI secretariat is based at World Bank okay so it is located I mean its secretariat is based at World Bank which assists the 13 tiger range countries which we already know to what to carry out their conservation strategies and drive the global tiger conservation agenda through planning, coordination and continuous communication. This is, this is what they do, okay? Global Tiger Initiative. Next is Global Tiger Forum. What is this forum and what is its purpose? Let us understand. So this Global Tiger Forum is the only intergovernmental international body, okay? Intergovernmental international body. For what? Which was established with the members from willing countries. So it is completely voluntary. That is what we need to know. So, all those willing countries will be joining this to embark on the global campaign to protect the tigers. Okay. And then it is located in New Delhi in India. Okay. So, its headquarters is at New Delhi. This is what we need to know. And it was formed on the recommendations from an international symposium which held in New Delhi, that is International Symposium on Tiger Conservation. This is what we need to know, okay? So, it was formed on the recommendation from an International Symposium on Tiger Conservation at New Delhi in India, okay? And out of the 13 tiger range countries, seven are currently the members of this GTF, okay? So, who are the seven members here? One is Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, India, Myanmar, Nepal and Vietnam. These are the seven countries. Along with them, there is also a non-tiger range country which is a member of this Global Tiger Forum that is United Kingdom UK. Okay. So, these details we need to know. These are very factual details which may be asked in your exam. Okay. Next is, what is the status of the tiger conservation globally? That we need to know and also what is the status in India? That we will study. Okay. So, the wild tiger status is good in South Asia and Russia, okay. So, in South Asia and Russia, the wild tiger status is good, okay. But the picture in Southeast Asia is actually grim, which means it is reducing in numbers. The tigers are reducing in numbers in Southeast Asia, thus posing challenges to global tiger population, okay. And then there has been an overall increase in the tiger population. Though there is decrease in population in Southeast Asia, but when we consider overall, then there is overall increase in the tiger population by 60 percentage, thus taking the numbers to 5,870. So the total number of tigers here is 5,870. But the countries like Bhutan, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam, these are the Southeast Asian countries which showed decline in the tiger population, which is important, making the situation grim in the tiger range countries of Southeast Asia. So, Southeast Asian nations, there the tiger population is reducing, whereas in South Asia and Russia, 
the tiger population is increasing this is what we need to know okay and the total number is also important so the success of the countries of south asia like bangladesh bhutan and india and even nepal along with china and russia these countries are showing success in the conservation status okay they attribute to the effective measures taken for the habitat conservation and protection of tigers here the india's world tiger sorry wild tiger population is 3167 okay of that 5870 that we saw 3167 is there in india only okay and then nepal has actually tripled the tiger population so these south asian countries are taking much efforts for tiger conservation this is what we need to know but then the situation is grim in southeast asian countries what are all the threats that is faced by tiger that we need to know the first one is prey and tiger poaching okay they are becoming prey and then they are i mean their prey is decreasing in number this is one problem and then tiger poaching is also a problem they are not having sufficient prey for them to feed on so they are getting into those areas where humans are settled okay thus they get into human animal conflict okay so this is how they are being killed and then they are also poached this is one threat next is low investment in wildlife conservation this is also a problem which the governments have to address okay next is habitat loss and fragmentation their habitat is being destructed for many purposes okay deforestation and other things are happening and then their habitat is also fragmented because of improper conservation efforts next is degradation of tiger habitat okay already exi existing habitat is being degraded be because of poor maintenance okay so this is what we need to know about the threats of the tiger population so with this we are coming to end of this particular topic The topic that we are going to discuss now is eliminating plastic pollution by 2040. Let us understand the details of the topic. Okay. So recently, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, that is OECD, has released interim report, which was titled "Towards Eliminating Plastic Pollution by 2040: A Policy Scenario Analysis." And this report. came ahead of the intergovernmental negotiating committee on plastic pollution which is scheduled to be happening in i mean it will happen in november i mean this month okay so this inc3 will be held in kenya nairobi okay in november 2023 for an international binding agreement on plastic pollution so in this intergovernmental negotiating committee an internationally binding agreement on plastic pollution will be taken okay so this is what we need to know and earlier this inc2 was held in paris france in june 2023 this year only and then this second one for this year will be happening in kenya in this month okay november month so this is what we need to know and what are all the key highlights of this report that we need to know and we must also understand in detail about what this intergovernmental negotiating committee is okay so let us understand it first key highlights of the report so in 2022 21 million tons of plastic leaked into the environment globally okay so these factual informations can be used in your answer writing and if no significant changes are made plastic usage would increase okay so we need to take efforts then only plastic usage can be curb okay else it will increase resulting in 50 percentage rise in the macro plastic leakage by 2040 okay and then this would mean approximately 30 metric ton sorry million ton okay so they are saying there would be 50 percentage rise of macro plastic leakage by the year 2040 so 50 percentage of this 21 million tons which would be roughly 30 million tons of plastic leakage into the environment and of this 30 million ton 9 million ton enters directly into the aquatic environment which is again a danger for the aquatic ecosystem okay so these are all the key highlights of this particular report and what is the cost of action 
we need to take efforts to curb this right for so for that a cost is involved what is that cost that we'll understand so global ambition with early stringent and coordinated policy action so we need to take early action stringent action and coordinated action okay could cut plastic waste generation in 2040 and it could virtually eliminate mismanaged waste okay so the, our primary focus must be there to eliminate mismanaged waste by 2040 from 119 to 4 million ton this is what the aim is and then as a result of eliminating this mismanaged waste the plastic leakage would also be nearly eliminated plastic leakage will also be eliminated when we eliminate mismanaged waste and then this would be to the amount of 1.2 million ton by the year 2040 which is okay which is a good thing next is these ambitious goal actions to tackle plastic pollution by 2040 would incur a cost amounting to 0.5 percentage of the global gdp okay which is a very huge amount okay so 0.5 percentage of the global gdp should go for this for plastic pollution then only we can achieve this ambitious goal that is what the report is saying okay what are the things that we have to understand what are all the financial needs and what are all the recommendations given by this report first is financial needs fast growing countries there are fast growing countries but then they are with less advanced waste management system okay so those are the countries which require significant investment for waste collection sorting and treatment so fast growing countries which are with less advanced waste management system must be i mean they require the maximum amount of investment that is 1 trillion us dollars between 2020 and 2040 next is international cooperation is deemed crucial due to uneven distribution of cost this is also important so only when there is international cooperation which means one country helping others in terms of technology or in terms of financial needs this international cooperation must be there for addressing this plastic pollution problem that is what is highlighted in this report what are the recommendations are given in this report overcoming technical and economic barriers we have technical barriers that is we already saw that less advanced waste management systems are there this is a technical barrier and there is also an economic barrier okay countries are struggling to invest a lot in these issues okay so this technical problem and economic barriers is essential to eliminate this plastic leakage by 2040 i mean to overcome these barriers is requ required to eliminate plastic leakage okay and then recycling breakthrough and scaling up well functioning international markets which are there for scrap and secondary plastic is a crucial strategy that we need to adapt okay so recycling breakthrough must happen and then we must have to scale up those well functioning international markets which are there for scrap and secondary plastics okay so this is what we need to know from this next is intergovernmental negotiation committee okay so this was the committee which is going to be happening i mean a meeting of this committee will be happening in november okay so this inc was established in february 2020 at the fifth session of unea that is united nations environment assembly what is this unea it is actually a governing body of UNET, that is United Nations Environment Program. Okay. And then a historic resolution was adopted to develop an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution, including marine environment, with the ambition to complete the negotiation by the end of 2024. So they are planning to end the negotiation by the year 2024. What is the negotiation for? It is for eliminating plastic leakage okay and then it should be a internationally legally binding agreement okay so this is what the focus is and then the first session of inc was held in uruguay in 2022 second session we saw it was in paris in june 2023 and then the third session will be happening in nairobi kenya in november 2023 this is what we need to know okay and what are all the objectives and the need for such a committee and such an international agreement 
legally binding agreement that we need to know okay so what is the need rapidly increasing levels of plastic pollution which represent a serious global environmental issue that negatively affect or impact the environment social and economic as well as the health dimensions of the sustainable development so plastic pollution is causing these many problems to the environment social i mean the to the society to the economy to the health of human beings and other life forms okay so that is the reason why we need such an internationally binding agreement next in the absence of a necessary intervention if there are no such interventions the amount of plastic entering into aquatic systems could nearly triple from 9 to 14 million tons per year in the year 2016 to a projected 23 to 37 million tons per year in 2040 which is very huge okay so international interventions are required okay next is what are all the objectives of this committee or this legally binding agreement so under this legally binding agreement countries will be expected to develop implement and update the national action plans so they must have to develop implement and improve their update their national action plans that reflect the country driven approaches to contribute to the objectives of this instrument that is this legally binding agreement okay so this is what we need to know from this news article so we saw that who has initiated this report and it has come before which committee i mean this committee that we talked about The topic that we are going to discuss now is Picocystis salinarum. So what is this Picocystis salinarum? It is actually an algae, okay? So recent research has de delved into mysteries of this Picocystis salinarum, which is a tiny green algae which survived in harsh saline alkaline condition. So these tiny green algae survive in harsh saline conditions okay that is why i mean a research has been made on these conditions or its ability to survive in such harsh conditions okay and then studying the organism's molecular mechanism okay so researchers are studying the organism's molecular mechanism and then the research revealed its unique adaptation what is the adaptation here that is boosting photosynthesis and atp synthesis that is adenosine triphosphate which is there for energy supply of any plants okay so photosynthesis and atp is being synthesized in this process and unlike most photosynthetic life in hyperosmotic condition so in hyperosmotic condition generally this boosting of photosynthesis and adenosine triphosphate will not happen but then these organisms are having this ability that is why it is a mystery okay and what is this hyperosmotic condition that we discussed here hyperosmotic condition refers to a situation where the surrounding environment has higher concentration of solutes so the surrounding environment will be having higher concentration of solutes when compared to the internal environment of a cell or organism so if there if this is that algae its surrounding environment will be having higher concentration of solute. Then such situation is called as hyperosmotic situation. Okay, hyperosmotic condition. Okay, so generally in such condition, boosting of photosynthesis and adenosine triphosphate will not happen. But then these picocystic salinarum are exhibiting that property. Okay, so that is what we need to know. What else do we have to understand? Beyond its resilience. This microalgae showcase potential for carbon capture and biomass production. Yet another important application of this algae. That is, it is helpful in carbon capture and then it is also involved in biomass production. Okay. So, when it is involved in biomass production, obviously it is a way for sustainable bio sorry, biological advancement. Okay. Biotechnological advancement. These are those algae. Okay. This is how it will be looking it is very tiny algae which is exhibiting these properties okay that is they can survive in harsh conditions saline and alkaline condition
The topic that we are going to discuss now is 77th meeting of standing committee of the sites. Okay. So what was discussed in this 77th meeting and what is its implication to India? That is what we need to know. So recently concluded 77th meeting of the standing committee of sites that is conservation sorry convention on international trade in endangered species of wild flora and fauna which happened in Geneva, Switzerland. It brought promising developments for India's wildlife conservation efforts. That is why we are discussing this importantly. Okay. So for India's wildlife conservation efforts, it has brought promising developments. What are they? One by one, we'll understand. First thing is the major outcomes of the meetings from Indian point of view. That is what we are going to discuss. And in that, the first one is call for big cat conservation. Okay. This call for big cat conservation is actually India's effort and this was endorsed in this meeting. Okay. So India advocated for stringent conservation measure for big cats, especially the Asian big cats, thus urging other range countries and stakeholders to join the international big cat alliance for their conservation. And this international big cat alliance was launched by Indian Prime Minister in April 2023. Okay. So this was actually discussed in this meeting and it was endorsed. Okay. Next is removal from review of significant trade for red sanders. Okay. So removal from review of significant trade. So what is this review of significant trade? What is that process that we need to know? And it is for these red sanders. So what are red sanders? That also we need to know. Okay. So India has been removed from this process. What is its implication? Let us understand. So India had been under this review of significant trade process of red sanders since 2004. Okay. And what is this process? This is a process through which the site standing committee places increased scrutiny on the exports of species. Here the species is the red sanders. Okay. Species from a country to determine if the convention is being properly implemented or not. Okay. So they are having an increased scrutiny on the export of species. But then now this increased scrutiny has been removed. That is because of the efforts taken by the Indian government. So owing to the compliance and the robust reporting, India has been removed from this process of review of significant trade, thus marking a significant achievement of the country's red sander growers. Okay. So next is what are red sanders? Red sanders are a type of tree species which is endemic. That is it is found only in those regions. Okay which is endemic to specific districts in Andhra Pradesh, which holds high market value and it has faced threat due to illegal harvesting and smuggling. Okay. That is why sites convention was there. I mean, sites compliance was there for this. Okay. So Andhra Pradesh important, red sanders, it is a tree species and then it has high market value. These details we need to know that it belongs to Andhra Pradesh region. Okay. Next is, what else was discussed in this meeting? That is, India's category in sites national legislation program. So, India has been placed in different cat category now. Why? So, the recent meeting decided to place India in category 1. That is because India had fully complied with the requirements of the sites national legislation program. So we need to know what is the sites national legislation program and what are the different categories under this program. Okay. So the sites provides that every party align its national legislation to accommodate sites provisions. So this is what the condition is. That is, it is expecting the countries, I mean the parties to align with its national legislation to accommodate size sites provisions. Okay. So previously India was listed in category two for sites national legislation program, but then now it has been upgraded to category one. We'll understand the types of category. Okay. The meaning of those categories. Next is why has India been upgraded from category two to category one? That is because this wildlife protection act of 1972 was amended last year in 2022. Okay. So there the provisions of sites were incorporated in the act just because of this it has been upgraded okay india's category from category 2 to category 1 this upgradation was done because of 
this amendment that we made to Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and then the amendment was done in the year 2022 where the provisions of sites were incorporated in the act. Okay. So, earlier in this act, four schedules, sorry, six schedules were there but then now only four schedules are there and then of those, the fourth schedule is completely dealing on those species which are placed in sites. Okay. So, this was the difference. I mean, this was the amendment that was made to this act. Next is, what is sites? That also we need to know. We are talking a lot about sites, but then what is sites? Let us understand this also, okay? So, sites is an international agreement which is aimed to ensure that international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten the survival of species. So, what is sites? Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. So, it is involved in international trade okay international trade in specimen of wild animals and plants and that trade should not threaten the survival of the species this is what the focus is and currently there are 184 parties to sites and it entered into force in the year 1975 and india became the 25th party this is also important and then although sites is a legally binding agreement on states it is generally not self-executing, very important, okay. Statements like these are very important from exam point of view that sites is a legally binding agreement but then it is not self-executing. What does it mean? It means that it cannot be fully implemented until specific domestic measures have been adopted for the purpose like we did in India recently in 2022. That is, we amended our Wildlife Protection Act for including sites provisions, okay. So, such specific domestic measures has to be made and it is therefore essential that sites parties have legislation in place allowing them to implement and enforce all aspects of the convention. This is what we need to know, okay. Next is sites national legislation program. We already saw under this national legislation program only the categories are based, okay. So, national laws must fulfill all these minimum requirements under sites national legislation program. What are the conditions? Requirements. First is, resign, sorry, designate a management authority and scientific authority. That amendment that we made to the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, which was done in the year 2002, in that we actually created management authority and a scientific authority. So, this has been designated. Next is, prohibit trade violating the convention. This is there. Next is, penalize such illicit trade that is also being followed in India. Next is, confiscate illegally traded or possessed specimen. This is also there. Okay. Those trophies and other things are to be possessed. They can be seized. Okay. So, these provisions are very much there in India's amendment, okay. These are all the national legislation program that is under sites. Next is the categories 1, 2 and 3. So, after consulting the concerned party, I mean here the party is the countries, okay. So, after consulting the concerned countries, the site secretariat assesses the national legislation concerning these criteria and categorizes it into three categories. What are the three categories? Category 1, what does it include? Legislation generally meeting sites implementation requirement. This has been done by India. That is why we are there in category 1. What is category 2? Legislation generally not meeting all sites implementation requirements. So, which means there are some implementation requirements which are met, but then not all. But then what is the third category? Legislation generally not meeting any sites implementation requirement that is category 3. So, we India have been upgraded from category 2 to category 1. This is what we need to know. Okay. I hope this is clear. The topic that we are going to discuss now is bioluminescent fungi that is Mycena chlorophos. So, what is this bioluminescent fungi? Where has this been found? All these details we need to understand. So, a team of researchers and the forest de department have found a rare bioluminescent mushroom that is fungi 
in Kanyakumari Wildlife Sanctuary. So, what is this bioluminescence that we need to know? It is the ability of those living organisms to emit light. So, when the living organism has this ability to emit light, then those organisms are called as bioluminescent organisms and that is bioluminescence. Okay. So, it occurs due to biochemical reaction between three chemicals or three substances. One is luciferins, oxygen and then an enzyme that is luciferase. Generally, this term luci means light. Okay. This we need to know. Luci means light. So, luciferase is the enzyme, luciferin a molecule and then oxygen. When these three biochemicals react, then those organisms emit light. Okay. That is bioluminescence and there are around 103 species of bioluminescent fungi in the world of which 7 are there in India. Okay. Important. Next is the benefit of bioluminescence in fungi is to attract insects for facilitating their spore dispersal. Okay. So, in fungus if there is bioluminescence then it is for attracting insects. Why will it attract insects? Because it has to spread or disperse its spores because through spore dispersal only these mushrooms will multiply or reproduce. Okay. So, for that reason this bioluminescence is helping. Next is there is a threat to this bioluminescence. So, this is how bioluminescent mushrooms will be looking. They will be looking so colorful and then they emit light. Next is what are, I mean, what are the challenges faced by these fungi? One is habitat destruction, next is climate change and then the other one is light pollution. Light pollution is also a major threat to these bioluminescent because they themselves are emitting light. If too much of light pollution is happening then their ability to emit light might get affected over a period of time. Such an evolutionary change might also happen because of light pollution. Okay. Next we need to understand about this sanctuary where this bioluminescent fungi was discovered. Okay. So, Kanyakumari Wildlife Sanctuary is a protected area in Kanyakumari district of Tamil Nadu, South India and this has been declared in 20, sorry, 2008. Okay. And this area is a tiger habitat which is important and there are seven rivers originating in the forest, I mean inside this wildlife sanctuary which includes Tamarabarani river and then Parali river also. Okay. Next is several new species of plants, amphibians, insects are discovered here in this Kanyakumari wildlife sanctuary thus making it an endemic region. So, it is an endemic region which means those species are found only in that region and nowhere else in the world. Okay. Next, it is home to threatened species like Indian bison, elephant, Indian rock python, lion tailed macaque, mouse deer, nilgiri tar, and sambar tree. These are all the endangered species which are protected in this wildlife sanctuary. We need to know. Okay. The topic that we are going to discuss now is new species of crustacean parasite. So, a new species of crustacean parasite has been found. Where it has been found? All these details we need to know. So, an ongoing study on deep sea crustaceans off the Indian coast has led to the discovery of the previously unknown family. So, they have discovered one family, okay, one previously unknown family two new genera and four new species of millimeter sized crustacean parasite which actually, so the name is parasite which means they are going to infest fishes and other marine life forms. They are going to depend on other organisms for their food, okay. Those organisms are called as parasites, okay. So, they are going to infest fishes and other marine life forms. So, researchers have named the new family as Uranoscopicolidae. Uranoscopicolidae. This is the new family's name. Okay. Why this name? That is because this parasitic copod or this crustacean species was found to live off Dolphus star grazer. Gazer. Okay. So, what is this Dolphus stargazer? It is a fish which is dwelling in the depths ranging from 
300 to 550 meters of the southwest Indian coast. Okay, just because these crustaceans are living off this fish, it is named as Uranoscopico lede because this species itself belongs to the genus Uranoscopico day. Okay, that we need to know. It is Uranoscopico day and this is Uranoscopico lede, which means they are staying off these fishes. This is also the first discovery and description of a new crustacean family from India, which is again important. So, a new crustacean family has been developed off the coast of, I mean, off the Indian coast. Next is, the discovery of new family, that is Uranoscopico lede, has led to creation of new genus and species, that is, Herodi Oshtikai. That is, the new species that has been created and it was found off Kolachal. Kolachal is Tamil Nadu coastal area. Okay. Kolachal in Tamil Nadu and these parasitic copods are known to infest wide range of host because it is a parasite. Okay. So, it infests sponges to marine mammals and among them fishes are the most likely potential host of these crustacean species. Okay. So, this is what we need to know and this is how it looks. The crustacean species looks like this. So, this is how the crustacean species look like, okay. And then they infest marine mammals and other fishes, okay. So, this is what we need to know. We have come to end of today's session. I hope you found the session to be very useful and informative. Let us see in the next session. Thank you.